Avi, when I try to understand something, what I like to do is try to understand the whole picture, get the, the, the whole, everything in, in some sort of a, 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 a framework, and then delve deep into each part so I understand the whole. So when I think about the universe, I, I try to see from the beginning to the end what it is. And you've been in a remarkable position. You began in your early part of your career focusing on first stars and uh, the the structure of the universe at its very beginning, after the, after the Big Bang, but as the first structure, and you've looked out 10 trillion years to the end of, so give me a sense of the, the total picture. Yeah, so things uh, started being interesting when the very first stars formed. Uh, let there be light. The universe was uh, getting darker and darker, and then the very first stars lit it up, uh, and that was, uh, 30 million years after the Big Bang. And as time went on, more and more stars formed inside bigger and bigger galaxies. Um, and galaxies like the Milky Way uh, started assembling. Uh, they are sort of midway between the small galaxies that formed early on and the biggest galaxies that formed most recently. The Milky Way formed when the universe was roughly half of its present age. And so, uh, here we find ourselves in a galaxy that is sort of typical, inside of which uh, stars like the Sun are common, but not the most common. Uh, there are lower mass stars that are more common. But at this time in the evolution of the universe, the age of the universe is similar to the lifetime of the Sun, which is mm. characteristic. If we were to live earlier on, the most the brightest stars would have had a shorter lifetime, uh, these would have been more massive stars. The very first stars were much more massive than present day stars. And they had short lives, just like stars in Hollywood. They <laughs> shine very brightly, but for a short time. And when you say short time, roughly how long? Uh, the most massive stars above several tenths uh, the mass of the sun live for a few million years. Oh, that's very short, because the sun, our sun is like uh, 10 billion years all, all in? That's right. And uh, the reason it's important is because these massive stars, if they have a mass somewhere between 8 times the mass of the sun and 25 times the mass of the sun, some of these stars explode and they disperse heavy elements into their environment. And without those heavy elements, life would not be possible because water, for example, needs oxygen. Um, carbon-based life needs carbon, and the, all of these heavy elements were produced in the interiors of stars and later dispersed into the interstellar medium, out of which later generations of stars like the Sun, including the planets around the Sun, were made. Now, in the distant future, the Sun will die and become a, a white dwarf. Uh, it will uh, contract and get its core that will weigh about 60% of the mass of, but of the current But first it will sun. expand. Basically. First it will expand, uh, almost engulfing the Earth uh, orbit with its uh, outer envelope, but then its core will contract and cool mm. to a metallic form, uh, roughly the size of the Earth. Uh, such an object is called a white dwarf, and it will steadily cool into the distant future. And the region around the White Dwarf will be habitable for a while, but as soon as it cools uh, several tens of billions of years from now, life would not be possible in the solar system. We would need to move somewhere else. And the obvious place to move to is the vicinity of low mass stars, dwarf stars, that have roughly a tenth of the mass of the Sun. They are more abundant than solar mass uh, stars. And they are long-lived. They burn their nuclear fuel much more slowly than stars like the Sun they would live for up to 10 trillion years. And in fact, we were trying to find out what's the record lifetime that we can find for a nuclear reactor held together by gravity, which we call a star. Yeah. Turns out that the hard limit is around 10 trillion years. Beyond that, we would not have these furnaces to keep us warm. Mm. We would need to use technology to keep us warm. So we can have uh, a nuclear reactor that we construct that will keep us warm beyond 10 trillion years from now. For now, we have stars. And um, in this period of time, would, would, could you classify different epochs? Uh, is there a way 
in, in this 10 trillion year period, can you divide it into segments? They don't have to be even by, uh, by, by years, but even by concept, and we can see how many years in each part, just to get a sense of structure. Right, so the very first segment in the history of the universe uh, was uh, an epoch during which the radiation uh, controlled the expansion of the universe. Uh, the universe was dominated by radiation, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, that lasted for a few hundred thousand years. And that was the do a dark period because you couldn't see through No, that. it was still uh, relatively bright in the sense that the temperature was above the surface temperature of the sun, so it was pretty bright. But that was the time when radiation dominated the universe. Right. And then as the universe expanded, the radiation cooled off and matter started to dominate. Uh, for a period of order um, five billion years, at, at which point the matter got diluted so much that it became less dense than the vacuum itself, what we call the cosmological constant. The dark energy. That the dark energy. It, it, it's causing the universe to increase, it, it accelerate its expansion. Right, so the vacuum does not seem to get diluted like matter. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, five billion years or so after the Big Bang, matter became less dense than the vacuum. And at that point in time, the expansion of the universe started to be dominated by the vacuum. And the universe started accelerating its expansion. And that's the epoch that we live in right now. Now, we don't know what will happen in the distant future, but if it continues like that, uh, the, the future is uh, not very promising for uh, astronomy. <laughs> because all the galaxies outside of our local region are receding away from us at a rate that keeps increasing with time. Eventually, they'll move away from us faster than light. Mm -hmm. And so we would not be able to receive any signals from those galaxies. Our galaxy will be surrounded by vacuum in the darkness. It will be the only galaxy within our observable volume of the universe. And that would be uh, we, a very lonely future that we have to live with. Before we get to that future, the Milky Way will merge with its nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, and make one giant galaxy that I coined the Milcomeda. <laughs> I wrote the first paper that studies what will happen in the next few billion years. Most of my colleagues do not care about the future because we can't observe it right now and they are very practical, even okay. though they do astronomy yeah. by looking at the sky. But I, I'm driven by curiosity, and I was wondering what will be there when the two galaxies, the Milky Way and Andromeda, will collide. They will uh, make a football-shaped galaxy, an elliptical galaxy, once they merge. The sky will change for us, uh, but all the other galaxies far away will be pulled away from us and eventually not be visible to us in the very distant future.